Should I go ahead and uh, share my screen now? I will introduce you first. Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> Yeah. The second speaker of today's colloquium is uh, Michael Yoshitaka Orwin, known as Mitchell from National University of Singapore. He's uh, an assistant professor there and also a presidential young professor uh, in uh, linguistics. He received his PhD from MIT in uh, 2014. His lab investigates the structure of sentences and how these structures map to meaning. The syntax semantics interface. Much of his work is based on fieldwork on understudied languages, especially of Southeast Asia. He also serves as associate editor at GLOSA and on the editorial boards of Natural Language and Linguistics Theory, as well as Journal of East Asian Linguistics. Micho was also uh, 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 the invited speaker for one of the Asian Junior Linguistic uh, Conference uh, that we held in uh, Hong Kong. So it was good to see you there, and it's good to uh, see you. Uh, here at ICU. Uh, it would be better to see you in person, but <laughs> this is uh, what we can do first. Yes, so let's welcome. Mitchell will talk about patterns of relativization in Austronesian and Tibetan. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen. Great. Um, thank you very much again for uh, for the opportunity to uh, join you, uh, albeit virtually. Um, I should say, so there's, I have slides. Um, there's also a handout, which I believe I sent, which uh, has the same information. Um, and I should also apologize at the top, my voice is, sounds slightly strange today, but I'm, I'm not, I feel fine, um, but just so you know. Um, so let's get started. Um, today I'll be discussing the grammars of so-called Philippine type Austronesian languages. Um, here I'll be using Tagalog um, and Tibetan. And I wanna highlight one striking similarity to start, um, which is that both languages or groups of languages use verbal affixes to mark the choice of relative clause pivot. So just to illustrate this first, in Tagalog, we have an agent relative, batang bumili ng tela, child who bought cloth, Telang binili nang bata, cloth that the child bought. And so these are verb initial languages uh, with uh, post-nominal relative clauses. And we see that we have a different verb form depending on whether we have a agent relative or theme relative. Going to a genetically totally unrelated language, typologically very different as well, Tibetan, we have a verb final language. These are pre-nominal relatives. So the word order seems exactly reversed actually. But again, when we have we have Teptikenmi, person who wrote or writes books, and Pemiti uh, books that Pema wrote, um, we have a different form of the verb based on that distinction. Now it's well known in each of those respective literatures that these languages have a rich inventory of these affixes that make such distinctions. So just to illustrate, um, so for example, in the perfective aspect paradigm in Tagalog, there's a four-way distinction for relative clauses that have an agent pivot, locative or goal pivot, instrument or beneficiary pivot, and a theme pivot. And in Tibetan, we look at the inventory and there happens to be a four-way distinction, right? For agent pivot relatives, uh, locative or goal pivot relatives, instrumental relatives, and theme relatives, right? Again, genetically unrelated languages, right? Now, to my knowledge, um, these parallels have never been investigated together before, um, in part because in their respective literatures, um, they've been described as part of very distinct systems. So for Philippine type languages, these facts are part of their language, these languages voice systems. Um, and for Tibetan and other Tibeto Burman languages as different types of nominalizations. And I'll be introducing both of these ideas in a moment. So today, what I'll show you is that when we dig deeper, when we do further empirical work, in particular on Tibetan, these patterns continue to exhibit striking parallels um, when we look at long distance relativization, which has previously not been described in Tibetan. And such data, I think, challenge the analysis of Tibetan relativization as built exclusively from nominalizations, which is an idea I'll introduce. Um, and I'll also try to present to you uh, one way that I think we can productively understand both the similarities and differences between the Philippine type languages and Tibetan in these systems. 
So here's a roadmap. I'll uh, start with a lot of background on Philippine type languages um, and then move to Tibetan with my original empirical work. Um, and then we'll bring everything back together and see what that teaches us. Um, so for starters, um, the morphological alternation uh, that was observed in Tagalog um, is actually part of a much more general alternation between different clause types. This is probably familiar for many of you, um, but in Tagalog, so this is a verb initial language, um, there are just different forms of the verb, different clause types um, that vary in the following way. So for example, if we say the child bought cloth at the market for mother, um, we can take the agent and put a particular marker on it, this ang marker. And when we have ang, uh, the ang marker on the agent, then we get a particular verb form. In Filipinist tradition, this tends to be called actor voice. Now, that's not the only way to express the sentence. We could also describe this event roughly uh, equivalently um, by choosing to put the ang marker on the theme cloth instead. And then we get a different corresponding verb form, which in this literature is called the patient voice. When we look at just this alternation between 4A and 4B, um, it's tempting to think of maybe the ang marked argument as something like the choice of subject. And, that, that tends to be how this is described in this literature. And therefore, to relate this alternation between 4A and 4B to a more familiar active passive alternation. Um, so there are a couple quirks uh, that make this a little bit interesting when described that way. First of all, is that the patient voice uh, doesn't actually, doesn't at least clearly demote the agent in any way. Um, but furthermore, even more strikingly, um, the language has other options for making other arguments, the unmarked argument. So for example, we can take the location that the buying happened in and make that the unmarked argument. And we get a different verb form called the locative voice. Or we could take the beneficiary here, mother, who the child bought cloth for. We can take that argument and make that the unmarked argument. We get a different verb form it's called the benefactive voice. But it's not an accident that because of this parallel to active passive voice alternations that this in this literature has traditionally been called voice. So just to clarify, every verb basically um, in uh, any, clause, any type of clause in Tagalog um, has one of these voice markers. It's crucially not just in relative clauses. As I introduced, the choice of voice marker correlates with the choice of unmarked argument, which here I'll call the subject in scare quotes. Um, we, in terms of an analysis, we could think of ang as a kind of nominative case, or for some authors, an absolutive case, which appears to override an underlying case marker. That's one way to think about it. There are others, and we'll, we'll come back to another very different approach at the end. And the connection to relativization comes from Keenan and Comrie's observation that not just in Austronesian, but there are languages of the world where only subjects can be a bar extracted. Let's say that these Philippine type languages have these elaborate voice systems and with multiple types of passives or something like that. And it has a subject only a bar extraction restriction. And th those two facts combined will explain the correlation between verbal morphology and the choice of pivot that we saw in relative clauses. Now, we're going to be talking about long distance relatives, so I want to introduce some clausal embeddings. So uh, clause embedding verbs like say in Tagalog also participate in voice alternations. So here's the verb say, nagsabi, in the sentence, the water buffalo said that the flower is delicious. This is an actor voice form of the verb, glossed AV, um, corresponding to the fact that it's the agent of saying, the water buffalo, that gets the ang marker. But it's also possible to have the verb say in a patient voice form, here, sinabi. Um, and here in this sentence in 5b, we notice that there's nothing that is unmarked because of that verb. The flower is unmarked, but it's the, you know, it's the unmarked argument of delicious. So there's nothing in the matrix clause that's unmarked. So the way to think about this formally is that the embedded clause, even though it is still introduced by the same complementizer like particle na, it doesn't change, it doesn't get ang. Formally, that embedded clause here is now functioning as the quote, grammatical subject. Now let's look at long distance relativization. 
We're going to form a long distance relative where the pivot is an embedded goal argument. So we're going to try to form water buffalo that the teacher said that the man would give a flower to. So first, it's going to basically look like this. When we look at the embedded clause inside the relative clause, we notice that give has to be in the locative voice, LV ending. What that means is that it's in it has to be in locative voice because the goal argument of the embedded clause is being extracted. And when we extract a goal, locative voice is the morphology that we need on the verb in order to make the goal argument the embedded subject. So this is expected, right? The pivot must be the, quote, subject of the embedded clause. Now let's look at the higher clause. Here, this has to be the patient voice form of the verb say. Another way of saying that would be that this seems to force the embedded clause that we are extracting out of to itself be the, quote, subject of the higher embedding verb say. And if we change this, for example, to actor voice, um, this becomes ungrammatical. Okay. I'll note too that in that previous example that I just showed, um, to make the embedded clause the quote subject of the uh, higher clause in the relative clause, uh, the patient voice form of say was used, but different embedding verbs will use different voices for this purpose. For example, for believe, then uh, to make the embedded clause its subject, we need to use locative voice. Um, and then in long distance relatives, we also use the locative voice. So to summarize all of this background, um, relative clauses in these so-called Philippine type Austronesian languages reflect the choice of pivot because of a combination of two factors, or at least that's the traditional description. They have a rich inventory of different kinds of voices, including options for making certain oblique arguments, the so-called subject, together with a subject only restriction on relativization. In long distance relativization, the embedded clause is required to be the higher verbs, quote, subject. In other words, the subject only extraction restriction seems to hold for each verb along the way in a complex chain of relativization. All of that is background. Uh, you'll see why. Uh, and now let's move to Tibetan. Now, let me give you a little bit of uh, basic uh, background on Tibetan. Uh, verbs in Tibetan end with a series of auxiliaries that here together I'll just gloss as aux, uh, which encode tense aspect evidential values. So here's a basic example. Tashiki tep digidu. Tashi's writing a book. The endings on the verb gidu are two morphemes actually, and they together express uh, the present progressive and uh, direct evidential value. If we want to take a sentence like this and form a relative clause based on this description, for example, uh, agent relative, what happens to the verb form is that we take the verb form digidu and we strip off all of those auxiliaries. We just get the stem, what remains here, d in this case, and then we add one of these so-called nominalizer suffixes. And I'll explain why these traditionally have been called nominalizers. Um, so in this case, we end up with deptikenmi, uh, which means person who wrote or is writing a book, et cetera. Um, because we're stripping off the auxiliaries which express tense aspect distinctions, the temporal interpretation in the relative clause in nine is underspecified. So that explains that contrast. The relativization in Tibeto Burman languages has been has been studied quite well, um, but it's been studied almost exclusively under the umbrella of nominalization, which is generally a major topic of study in this area of linguistics. Um, so, for example, in Tibetan, there are event nominalizations like Knowing Tibetan is very important. My teachers like to say that. Um, but you know, we can take the root she um, and we, we use one of these endings, pa, just to get uh, event nominalization to describe the state of knowing Tibetan. Um, but we can also use the kind of ending again here, pa, uh, to get uh, argument nominalization as well. So, for example, a theme nominalization like in 11, peme supate, peme supate, what pema made. So the idea would be that when we have an object relative or a theme relative, you are just taking one of these theme nominalizations and sort of 
using that to modify a noun, in this case, momo, oh, sorry, that's a, that's a kind of dumpling. Um, and so we have pemesu pa, what pema made, and dumpling, momo, and we juxtapose these, and that's how we form the, what descriptively we would call a relative clause construction, the momo that pema made. Just to spell this out a little further, this is a, a hypothesis that has been uh, widely adopted and, and has been very influential in Tibeto-Burman linguistics, that in adnominal modification, at least in Bodic, that is Tibetic languages, um, they are probably best viewed as NPs juxtaposed to the NPs they are modifying, the two NPs constituting, therefore, a kind of appositional structure. So schematically, again, this is an argument nominalization together with uh, a noun phrase. Um, and very often there's a genitive linker that appears in between um, in Tibetan, but as, as well as in many related languages. And semantically, we can easily cash this out um, with intersective modificational semantics, right? So we, if we take the set of what Pima made, think of those things, and think of the set of dumplings, and we intersect them, then our referent that we are describing with the description, the momo that Pema made, um, is going to be that resulting intersective set. So this seems like a, a very nice story. Now let's talk about the inventory of nominalizers before we come back to this nominalization idea. Um, I'm expanding here a little bit on what I introduced at the top. So there is, again, this four-way distinction. Ken is used for agent relatives, but also certain kind of non-agentive subjects. So um, in particular, uh, possessors of possessive descriptions, um, when you extract those, you get Ken. Um, locative and goal relatives, you use Sa, instruments, and also imperfective theme relatives, you get Ya, and perfective themes then uh, get Pa. So there's an interaction here with aspect and the choice of pivot um, in terms of the morphology that you get for theme relatives. Um, and this will be relevant later. Just to give you some more examples, here's an example of a locative relative. Uh, the place that Pema made or makes dumplings. The steamer that Pema made or makes dumplings with. I, sorry, there's a lot of text here, but I want to highlight something about these nominalizers. Um, one is that there's, so there are a number of reasons to think that PA and the other nominalizers uh, seem to have a very different status in the language. So one is that historically in classical Tibetan, there was only PA and cognates of PA are exactly what's found all across the tibeto burman family. Um, all of the non-PA endings, those more sort of specialized ones um, are innovations that occurred later in the history of the language. Um, the second point is that there's a phonological or morphophonological difference between pa and the other markers. That's the point two there from uh, Scott Delancey's work. Um, and then also uh, another morpho, uh, morphosyntactic thing, um, which is that for certain verbs that take uh, different stem forms, this is point three, um, pa will take the perfective stem while the other markers take the so-called imperfective stem. Um, so again, there's a slight distinction perhaps in the structure or in uh, the details of the pa marker versus these other markers. And this is to foreshadow something uh, that I'll introduce in a moment. But let's move first to the main event, which is the new data on long distance relativization. Um, to my knowledge, no previous work has described long distance relativization in Tibetan, uh, nor in any other uh, Bodic language. All of the data here comes from my own field work conducted in Dharamsala, India um, in uh, two previous summers, um, and they reflect the consistent judgments of nine speakers. So in order to build up to long distance relatives, let's start by looking at what an embedded clause would look like. So here we have Tashi ki peme momosu song lapsong. Tashi said that peme, uh, Pema made dumplings. Here we have this center embedded kind of word order, very, very natural in Japanese. Um, and now let's try to take that embedded theme and relativize over that position. <laughs> 
we end up with the following result. Let me walk you through this because there's a lot here. Um, first of all, the word order is interesting. So this is Tashi said, that whole higher clause, then Pima make, and then the head noun. Um, and now let's look at the morphology here, right? So we get the marker pa, and that's not surprising because this is a theme relative. But notice that we get the pa marker both on the higher verb say and on the lower verb make. Neither of these verbs could be changed to a full finite form. Now, immediately from this kind of data point, we have an argument against the view that relativization always just comes from nominalization, where that view that I introduced, where a verb plus nominalizer ending is a pre-built argument nominalization, which intersectively modifies the noun phrase. So just to uh, spell this out, the example that I just showed schematically is Tashi said, Pema made dumpling. Um, and we would imagine then under this simple hypothesis that this should be um, the intersection of what Tashi said, what Pema made and dumplings. And clearly that's not gonna give us the right semantics for the dumplings that Tashi said that Pema made. For one, these dumplings that Tashi said that Pema made aren't necessarily something that Pema made because Tashi could be lying, Tashi could be mistaken. Um, and also it's very strange to think that these are actually individuals that Tashi said, right? They are actually the objects of what Tashi said. That doesn't make sense either, right? So this sort of straightforward and initially appealing idea that relativization descriptively all comes from these argument nominalizations uh, seems to not work at least synchronically. Now let's talk a bit about the word order, the interesting word order that we saw. Just to uh, show you a, a related baseline, embedded clauses generally, as we saw, get the center embedding word order uh, like in Japanese, uh, it generally these embedded clauses cannot be postposed as in 20, so that's ungrammatical. And therefore, the placement of the embedded clause after the higher verb, like in the long distance relative that we just saw, um, must specifically be something due to the process of long distance relativization. Um, there are also long distance relatives that preserve the center embedding word order, which I'll introduce in a moment, um, as well as pivot internal relative clauses, which uh, in the interest of time, I won't be uh, presenting here. Let's look at different types of long distance relatives now. We've seen a long distance theme relative. Let's go to the long distance relative of an embedded agent. So here we have tashiki lappe momoso ken mite the person that Tashi said made or makes dumplings. Notice here that we get the agent relativization marker ken on the lower verb make, and we get pa on the higher verb, what we think of as the theme relative marker pa on the higher verb. We can't change either of these to a full finite embedding, a uh, full finite verb with an auxiliary. Um, and we also can't switch the position of these markers, for example. Exact same pattern holds for other types of long distance relatives. So here's a long distance locative relative. Tashiki lappe peme momo su se sacha. So the place that Tashi said Pema made or makes dumplings. Or uh, here the steamer that Tashi said Pema made or makes dumplings with. In all of these cases, we get pa on the higher verb and the more specific locative relative marker sa or instrument relative marker ya on the lower verb. So, so far as a generalization, we've seen that the embedded verb suffix reflects the type of pivot noun that is being extracted. Um, and the higher verb in these examples so far have always ended in pa. Now, it's not always the case that the higher verb ends in pa. So here's one such example that's different. Tashiki sam ye momo suken mite. So uh, the person that Tashi thinks made or makes dumplings. What's different here is that we change the higher verb from say to think. And if the higher description say uh, is say, we think of that as something that someone said, so as a perfective description, 
But if it's something we think, we naturally think of this as something that where the thinking is ongoing, where that's an imperfective description. And remember that with theme relatives, there's this aspectual interaction. With perfective descriptions, you get pa for a theme relative, but with imperfective descriptions, you get ya. So the higher clause, changing that to think, makes it so that the higher clause is naturally interpreted as an imperfective description. And corresponding to that, uh, correspondingly, we get the ya marker on the higher verb. So what we take away from this is that it's not just that the higher verb is always pa. It seems to actually reflect some productive alternation, reflecting, in this case, the uh, as if we are doing a theme relative out of the higher clause. So here's a quick, very simple schematic proposal for how we can think about this. So um, each instance of long distance relativization that we've seen of the type that we've seen involves two overt steps of movement involving two different kinds of targets. So if we start with a clause schematically in 25 with this word order, and suppose we want to form a relative over the embedded agent person, we first, well, without saying it, stipulating an order, one movement that happens is to move that embedded clause to the right, right? I'm just illustrating this as movement to the right. We can worry about exactly how this manifests, but that's one movement that needs to happen. And another is to get the pivot noun actually out of there as well. So we have these two distinct steps of movement or distinct sort of rearrangement, distinct movement processes. So the idea I'd like to propose is that relativizing morphology appears with each of these steps of movements um, and in, it's in a totally predictable way. So when we move the embedded clause out of the higher verb say, we are moving the theme of say, and therefore we get theme relativization morphology. That's gonna be pa if the higher description is perfective, but it'll be ya if it's imperfective. And then we also move the pivot noun out of the lower clause. And here that's an agent and therefore we get agent relativization morphology locally on the lower verb make. And in this way, more generally, we can explain the choice of so-called nominalizer markers on these relative clauses, thinking of them as a kind of extraction marking morphology showing up on each verb in a complex chain of relativization. Now, um, in the interest of sort of completeness, I want to also share with you now uh, the facts from center embedded relatives where the facts are interestingly different. So uh, this is the uh, another way of saying those momo that Tashi said that Pema made, uh, Tashi ki Peme su song lape momotetsu. What's interesting here is that we get the pa marker once. We get the pa marker on the higher verb say, but we get the finite auxiliary, we, we get the full finite form on the embedded verb make. So in center embedded rel theme relatives, pa only goes on the higher verb, um, and it's not possible, for example, to put pa on the lower verb, which is what we saw when we have this sort of extraposed word order. It's also not possible to make the higher verb uh, finite, for example. Now let's look at a long distance agent relative with the center embedded word order. And here we get this sort of more uh, expected or at least familiar morphology where like in other long distance relatives, which we've already saw, uh, which we've already seen, we get uh, marked extraction marking morphology by which I mean the specialized agent locative or instrumental morphology on the local lower verb. And simultaneously, we get pa at the edge of the higher verb, at the edge of the entire relative clause. It's not possible to change that to a finite form or put the agent relative marker on the higher verb, et cetera. So ultimately then, it, that, that what, this, what these center embedded relatives tell us is that the sort of cleanest picture that I told you just, just a few minutes ago um, gets a little bit more complicated, in particular in the status of the ken sa ya markers versus pa. So it seems that across the board, 
the right way to think about this is that ten saya always indicates the presence of a marked local gap of a particular thematic or sort of grammatical type. And pa more generally is something that does appear more generally to reflect the edge of a landing site of overt movement. Where here in these center embedding relatives, we can think of this as just one chain of movement. I mean, sub, uh, ostensibly successive cyclic, but nonetheless, one chain of movement moving just to the pivot, and therefore you just get one, uh, one instance of pa in a theme relative. And these suffixes uh, cannot co-occur on the same verb, so there's going to be some kind of morphological process that might filter out uh, forms like a verb ken pa uh, for uh, local agent relatives, for example. So again, in these center embedded relatives, there's only one movement, overt movement chain. Um, and therefore we only get one pa at the end necessarily for the long distance theme relative. Whereas in the non-center embedded word orders that we've seen, which we can actually think of as maybe a kind of process of clausal pied piping. Um, in those cases, there are movements involving overt movement of the embedded clause, as well as overt movement of specifically the pivot. And that's why we consistently get the markers on each and every verb in those earlier word order relatives, which I showed. So now let's bring everything back and understand these facts together. So both Philippine type Austronesian languages and Tibetan use verbal morphology to distinguish relative clauses with different pivots. And as I discussed, um, at first glance, it appears that this may simply be a superficial parallel um, because they're due to very different mechanisms, or so it seems. So in Philippine type languages, these voice markers appear in all types of clauses, not only in relative clauses, but in Tibetan, this phenomenon is really just limited to uh, these relative clause forms. However, when we look at the behavior of long distance relatives in Philippine type languages and Tibetan based on data which has never been looked at before in Tibetan, it seems like this parallel goes even deeper, right? So we can say here the following generalization that in long distance relatives, each verb reflects the thematic role of its local pivot gap or the embedded clause containing the pivot gap. And this description applies to both Philippine type languages and Tibetan, at least the uh, non-center embedding type of relative clause. So um, earlier I introduced the idea that these so-called Philippine type voice systems um, are a kind of argument structure alternation, where we choose a different argument to be the so-called subject, combined with the fact that the language has a subject only relativization uh, restriction. But there's also an another alternative approach to Philippine type voice systems on the market, um, which involves the following two ingredients of, in its analysis. Uh, element A is that Philippine type voice mor morphemes are some kind of extraction marking morphology. They are responses to extraction of a particular kind of argument. And element B is that every clause is required to choose one nominal to participate in extraction or a similar process. And that will explain the fact that in every type of clause, we get this A process morphology. So let me talk a little bit more about these two components of the analysis, A and B. We can relate this B requirement to something very familiar, that, like the pre-field requirement in Germanic V2. So here illustrating with Swedish, we know that we have to move some constituent to the beginning of the clause in a V2 clause. So that could be the subject, but that could also be an object, for example, uh, satisfying the V2 requirement. So more generally, it's a familiar idea that certain languages have a requirement that in each clause, you choose one argument to be special in some way, by default, a topic. In Germanic V2, you then move it to clause initial position. Under this view, in Philippine type languages, you give that special argument a particular case or marker like Tagalog ang, but you don't overtly move it. 
And then I'll also note that there are languages that have this kind of requirement that where you, in every clause, you choose one argument as special and you move it to clause initial position and give it a particular case as, in, as uh, has been described in uh, a nilotic language, Dinka. Um, there are, of course, languages that don't have this B requirement, so this is a point of cross-linguistic variation. It's something that English doesn't have, but Germ many Germanic languages do. Furthermore, we know from Germanic V2 that if you have A bar extraction, like relativization or WH movement, it also has to proceed through this B position, uh, B process position. For example, Inside a relative clause in Swedish, like the girl that has combed her hair, it's not possible to simultaneously move something to the pre-field position, the topic position inside the relative clause. So thinking about this and now describing Philippine type languages in this way, we can, if we assume that the assignment of ung, that marker, and abar extraction underlyingly involve the same type of process, and both feed the extraction marking morphology, then we can derive what was originally explained as the effects of a so-called subject-only extraction restriction without thinking of the unmarked argument as a subject at all. Now, going back to Tibetan and understanding its relation to the Philippine type languages, my proposal is that Tibetan relativization suffixes are responses to extraction of a particular type of argument, just like we saw in these Philippine type voice system markers. Um, however, Tibetan doesn't have this second part of the Philippine type languages. Tibetan doesn't have a requirement for some argument to participate in this process in every clause, unlike in those Philippine type languages. And this explains the fact that these verb forms that show this kind of specialization only appears in relative clauses, not in regular finite clauses. And furthermore, if we think of this response mechanism, this extraction marking morphology is something that generally applies per clause, then we can really deeply unify the behavior of long distance relatives in Tibetan and Philippine type languages in this way. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh And <laughs> let's see whether anybody has question. Oh, yeah. But the first question comes from Rajesh Bhatt, uh, University of Massachusetts. Please, uh, yeah, unmute your microphone and share. Yeah. Thank you, Mitchell. This was really uh, uh, very enjoyable and like, <laughs> very impressive like the way you put these things together um so uh first uh i wanted to understand uh how um can we sort of look at a derivation something like around 28 or so like how, how do we get to the meaning because I, what i saw you were you took the embedded clause and you moved uh, yeah something like this right so so how is this uh, so the it's the embedded clause that's moving out and then the person is so how is person getting scope over uh, a, a say uh, yes great question uh so I think that, I mean, there's a reason that um, here in the analysis, I have given you, I have told you what I feel that I know confidently, and I did not try to uh, speculate more in terms of more of these details. So there's clearly a lot of details here that uh, ultimately we would want to know including, uh, you know, what exactly is the nature of the movements that gets us this word order, um, including your question of what exactly is the relationship of 
uh, well, another way of framing this might be, what is the relationship of the, the pivot noun, the head noun of the structure that we interpret versus even the, the head noun that we actually pronounce? Because it, it might not exactly be the same. There might be uh, another instance of person on top and some kind of matching structure or something like that, right? And that might be, that might be a more parsimonious way of thinking about this structure, especially if we want to relate the movement of the embedded clause to causal oh. typing of some sort. Right. That's one thing that I've thought about. Um, but also, you know, um, you know, do we really want to describe this as some kind of rightward movement? And also, uh, do we, you know, what exactly is the mechanism that gets us this extraction marking morphology? Right. I've I've been vague about that. Right. Um, and that's mostly because I think uh, just there probably are various different analytical options to that we could consider um, that uh, you know we could describe, but. Um, you know, here I decided to just present, you know, here's, I think, what uh, it gives us certain bounds on what an analysis would need to look like. Um, I think the details, I think there are different ways of caching that out, but. Yeah, I mean, it, I've, I've never, like, I mean, this is very cool because it kind of looks like a kind of roll up style movement inside relative clauses, except this is the first time I've seen that. So I, it's not immediately clear but like yeah uh, so i think uh, the on the syntactic side this seems very plausible uh, and then but so then we just need to be more creative with the semantics yes uh, I yeah um i have two data questions that if uh, so since uh, which i'll ask uh, one is um, do you know what happens with uh, is there non-finite embedding in Tibetan? And uh, so uh, if you're trying uh, these normalization uh, suffixes, presumably would they, can you put them on non-finite clauses or uh, so like wants to eat or something, the apple that John wants to eat uh, or, I mean, do they behave just like simplex uh, clauses? Uh, of, Yes. So what you get is, I mean, so descriptively you get, um, you know, the, a, a complex verb form where you you get you get like each want auxiliaries, right? And then if you relativize over that, then you just strip off those auxiliaries. So you don't get any marker along the way between eat and want, for example. I see. I see. Um, yeah. And presumably you cannot extract out of. Uh, non-finite, uh, sorry, uh, uh, adjunct clauses, uh, non-finite adjuncts or adjunct clauses, those should probably be. Yes, so adjunct clauses, I mean, I know that I, I need to, I need to check whether wh what I looked at, cause, cause the, the you know, this field work was a, a bit ago. I know that I definitely was trying, um, extraction out of uh, relative clauses, just to convince myself that there's movement mm -hmm. going on. And there, there certainly are island effects of that sort, um, trying to make things very plausible, but I don't remember what kind of adjuncts I tried, um, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question comes from uh, Tommy Lee, University of Southern California. Yeah, um, thank you, Mitchell. Um, this is very interesting. And uh, I have uh, like one quick clarification question on this, right on this 25. So I was wondering um, if like the base position for person should be the like the, the position next to a dumpling. Shouldn't that be the case? I mean, and then you got like one step movement to the left and then you move out of the whole clause. Wait, so, um, I mean, so this is a long distance agent relative. So the person, the pivot is the, uh, is the, you know, the subject of making a dumpling, right? Right. Yeah, so that's, uh, I think, I, I think I'm missing something. Can you? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I was just wondering. So, so this is, so the original sentence is like Tashi said, uh, someone is making uh, yes. made yes. something yes so, and, right right this is so 
yeah, so I was wondering why don't we have like the the base position for person should be like the most in the most embedded position, and then it yes. move one step upward or like one step like it move across one class, and mm -hmm. then do something on the verb. That's why the verb like got the pa the pa morpheme, and then it move out. So shouldn't that be the, the ordering? I mean, it seems that like you 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 the first step is like moving into the embedded class. I mean, the picture that you just show. Uh, I mean, maybe maybe this was maybe my diagram was unclear. But what um, what's moving is the what I what I mean to indicate is that the embedded clause has to. Oh oh. Sorry. Right. Okay. I, okay. Okay. So okay, that arrow is pointing to the whole whole object. Okay. Yes. Sorry. The yes. whole right. whole embedded right. clause. I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah. 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 That's what I meant to indicate. Yeah. Yeah. And and one more question is about about so do we observe similar pattern, uh, in like any other like long distance movement like, um, I don't know if, topicalization or focus movement. Oh. So yeah, great question. Um, I've tried. I've uh, um, so there's no WH movement. I mean, nothing obligatory per se. Um, it's WH and C two. Um, so the thing that I've tried is I've tried to test long distance scrambling, and um, I so it long distance scrambling. I mean, maybe I failed to construct it correctly or failed to test for it correctly, but it's not um, its not great. I mean, sort of, I was actually surprised um, uh, that for, you know, this kind of a language, I, I feel like I'm familiar with verb final languages and I feel like you should be able to do long distance scrambling, but but that doesn't wasn't very great. Um, and regardless of the kind of morphology that you use, right? So, um, so indeed, yeah, you you might think under the story that I'm telling here, um, you can do long distance scrambling, but it changes the morphology on the embedded clause that you moved out of, or something like that. So, I did try things like that, but but that doesn't seem to improve it. So, um, so in Tibetan, as far as I know, um, this process is at least productively really limited to relativization. I see. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from Hajime Ono to the college. Hi, Micho. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you for sharing this great, fantastic facts. I really wanted to go to my Taiwan, you know, fieldwork and Tongan fieldwork to do the same thing. Um, can I just make, uh, this is a clarification question. Um, the, the, the speaker of this language has any preference between these uh, great typed one and the yes. center embedding one? Yes, yes. So, um, I mean, there's a reason, well, there are multiple reasons why I presented it the way I did, but one is that, um, so this word order relative clause, like in 25 here, um, this is the first thing that you get in translations. Um, and then uh, and then the, the next best one um, is, a completely head internal, completely pivot internal relative. Um, the center embedding preserving order that I presented after here is something right. that I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I never got through translation. Like I mm. constructed them and speakers accepted them, but I never got them in translation. And my my hunch is that, um, you know, when you have that that amount of sort of center embedding, um, with a gap in there, um, just processing wise, it's not, it's not preferable. I mean, in, in Japanese, we say these things, so it's possible. But um, if you're a language that has this option, like in 25, then, you know, that's much easier because you don't need to continue to, you know, keep track of what arguments you have and how they relate to the verb, right? So, um, so that's, uh, so that's something I can say about the relationship wow. between these constructions, but. I see. So mm -hmm. is there any difference between like a reconstruction path and something like that? I, I mean, I, I have not tried. I, I, I want to, um, but uh, I have not gotten there. I, no, I mean... but still this, this, these facts are fantastic. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much.
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we have one more question uh, from So Miyagawa, Kyoto University. Hi, um, thank you so much, Micho. Very, very interesting. Um, I'm very, very uh, fascinated by your talk. Um, I'm working on, currently working on Nubian um, relativization, uh, especially its you know, finite, finiteness of reduced um, relative clause. And um, I have some links, some similarities with Tibetan in your presentation is very, very interesting. Uh, I'm uh, very, uh, once I uh, had a talk, had a, had a discussion with uh, Matt Shibatani about uh, nominalization uh, and uh, he argues that um, non-finite, non-finiteness of BP is uh, kind, is itself uh, nominalized and the this pa thing, pa, 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 yeah, it's a pa in uh, Tibetan is like, uh, it's a non phrase um, marker, not nominalized in so. Um, I'm not so, I, I didn't step deep into his argument, but um, it's very, very interesting suggestion. Uh, but uh, but uh, your, your, your argument that, the, um, uh, sorry, um, but the, you know, uh, the, Mkan Sayag indicates indicate a marked local gap and also power reflecting edge that is the landing site of overt movement is very, very uh, plausible and I agree with that. But what would I'm also very interested in the kind of possibility of the kind of classical interpretation of the nominalization and especially interested in the why it requires E, the genitive with the uh, pa and also the I'm very interested in the non finiteness of the uh, verb in the relative clause. What do you think about this, um, especially this genitive, uh, requirements of the genitive for pa? Um, yeah, so thank, thank you very much. So there's, yeah, so there's a few things there. Let, let me try to address them. So I just, just first on the genitive, I mean, um, I don't have much to, I don't have anything smart to say about the genitive. Um, I'll note that for the speakers I've worked with, um, right, so there are these four markers, I, I'm not gonna move my slides. So so just there are these four markers, there's Ken, Sa, Ya, Pa, and I mean, Ya, the way it's spelled here in, in Tibetan, in the in the Tibetan orthography ends with a consonant, but but synchronically it just seems like Ya, there doesn't seem to be a consonant there. And so it seems like the distribution of the genitive there is, you know, it's sort of there by default, and then uh, as some kind of linker between a noun and its modifier of this form, um, and it productively shows up with sa ya pa because those are verb final, and then it becomes se ye pe. Um, it doesn't show up after ken, I think, because of for probably phonological reasons. Um, and I've also had speakers volunteer uh, ken e. Um, and actually just giving an extra syllable there, right? But I think there's sort of just a phonological preference for that. I th don't think it's a strict difference. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. On the connection to PA as just a kind of non-finite marker um, it, it, and, and just this question of finiteness. So there are two things that I, I, I wanna say. Um, one is just that I think it's okay. I think we can just be open to the possibility that there are multiple uses for this marker pa in the language. So, um, you know, there might be pa, if I'm correct about the structure of relative clauses, then there is a pa that really um, marks uh, the landing site of overt movement in these relative clause constructions, but I, I don't doubt that maybe there really is just a pa ending that takes something more like a non-finite verbal projection directly and forms, especially those event nominalizations, right? That might just be, you know, some kind of nominal by itself without any sort of extraction. Um, and we, I think we can be open to that possibility, but then one last thing, I mean, this is this is very relevant. Let's see. Actually, it's really striking with the center embedding, right? So this in this example, um, I think there is something really interesting um, that we have to be open to when we look at examples like this one in 27. 
which is that here, I mean, we're not doing anything strange, like we're not extraposing the embedded clause here, so, um, or pied piping or however we wanna think of it. The embedded clause is still in the normal embedded clause position as the argument of say, but it has this Ken suffix on it, right? So, I mean, it depends on how we wanna think about it, but at least in some sense, this verb that ends with Ken or the clause that has Ken on it has to be able to be a clause, right? It still is the complement clause of say. And that means then, even though you're stripping off the tense aspect evidential morphology, even though therefore descriptively it's non-finite, um, and in fact, descriptively, it looks like it's nominalized, um, it still functions as a finite clause complement of say. Um, and so, um, you know, maybe we want to think of that as some kind of morphological opacity. That's the way I've described it here, that maybe it started as a finite clause, but then by moving out of it, you get this morphology. Um, but alternatively, if you want to think that, if you want to push that nominalization view that all, that, for example, Solken is clearly some kind of nominal, um, then I think it really complicates the story for what's going on for these types of long distance relatives, where then now you have to be able to take that as the argument of say, for example, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, thank Micho uh, one more time. Uh, we will have a little bit more time after uh, the closing of the session. So if you have some uh, question or comments, please uh, stay. Uh, let me uh, wrap up the event. Uh, thank you to uh, today's two speakers, uh, Micho and uh, Professor Rajesh Bhatt. Uh, I would also like to thank co-hosts of the series, Professor Tomoyuki Yoshida and uh, Professor Yoko Mizda, as well as two assistants, Yuki Baldoriau and Miyu Izuka. We also had uh, help from the Liaison Institute assistant, Michinori Suzuki. This event was supported by shared budget of ICU Research Institutes and Institute for Education Research and Service and the Linguistic Lab at ICU. Please mark your calendar for the uh, next part of the ICU Linguistic Colloquium on May 22nd, uh, it's also Saturday, Benjamin Bruning from University of Delaware and Shin Fukuda from University of Hawaii will share their research. Uh, the time uh, will be the same. We also have a phonetic talk series in collaboration with KU University on May 10, that's next Monday, Jenny Ballett from University of California at Santa Cruz and Hannah Sander from University of California, Berkeley uh, will share the research. Uh, thank you all who participated in today's colloquium, and we hope to see you on May 10 or May 20. The recording uh, should stop now.